The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to the January 2020 edition of the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club Podcast. The Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum is dedicated to the promotion, education, and dissemination of pre-hospital research. We believe it is the responsibility of emergency medical professionals worldwide to build a body of evidence to examine pre-hospital emergency care. With the PCRF Journal Club, we take a closer look at some of the latest research happening in EMS. I'm Remley Crow, and I am joined by Dave Page, Dr. Tony Fernandez, and Dr. Bill Toon. We are also really excited to have with us a special guest, the lead author of today's article, Madison Rivard. Madison recently completed her MPH at The Ohio State University as part of the EMS Research Fellowship at the National Registry of EMTs, and she's done a lot of great work related to the EMS workforce, so we're really glad to have her here with us today. The name of the article that we're going to review is The Impact of Working Overtime or Multiple Jobs in Emergency Medical Services, which was just published in Pre-Hospital Emergency Care. This review is paired with an article written by columnist Dr. Tony in EMS World called Journal Watch. We encourage our listeners to check out this article at emsworld.com under the category of education and training. Today, as we begin, we want to remind all of the listeners that you can use the chat feature on your screen to type in questions and comments as we go, and we'll bring those into the conversation. I know that there's a lot of conversation to be had, so we hope that you'll participate. And with that, Let's take a second and dive in. So thank you, Madison, for being here with us. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. I think it makes sense for us to start off talking a little bit just about what the objective of this paper was. And so that was to evaluate the association between job satisfaction, intent to leave EMS, and financial dependence on overtime or multiple jobs. This is a really important topic. So I was just wondering, Madison, if you could tell us a little bit about why it was you decided to take this topic on? Absolutely. Um, that's kind of, you know, the big picture is always what um, motivates and drives my research. Um, so we wanted to take a look at uh, additional work, and that often occurs in the form of overtime or multiple jobs. Um, so in EMS, anecdotally, we know that a lot of people often work in uh, perhaps a fire agency as well as a private company on the side. Um, or overtime is quite common. So um, in terms of uh, EMS being a unique field, often kind of the ability to, uh, to have additional work in the form of one form or the other is quite common. Um, so anecdotally, as well as um, from my own experience as an EMT, um, that's quite common for people who um, EMS is their career. Um, however, rather than working, you know, the typical nine to five, um, 40 hour work week, and instead kind of the opposite happens in EMS. Um, so we know that this was occurring, but we really wanted to look at the impact this could have or um, essentially do some um, some analysis to be able to say, you know, people are working additional hours and this then is associate, associated with X, Y, and Z, and this could result in, um, you know, what this means for the workforce um, on kind of the broad general level as well as on the individual level. So that was um, that was a little bit of the background and the reasoning for uh, why we conducted this study. Thanks for that. All right. I think it's awesome that you, you studied this, by the way. Um, in, in, uh, in so many ways, we know this to be true. It's kind of like a, a fact of life. And, and some people would say, well, why even do research? Of course, duh, we are all doing that. But thank goodness for your work because this is the kind of work that needs to happen for people to kind of wake up and go, wow, we are um, really actually in a, in a bad way, uh, overstretched and underpaid. So congratulations. Thank you for, for contributing this to the scientific literature. Thank you very much. Um, um, it's it's truly an honor, and even uh, this past week at NEMSP, um, you know, one of the one of the bigger EMS conferences, it was great to see people who had read this paper uh, were talking about it as well, kind of 
um, there was, um, in, in fact, there was kind of a community um, discussion that happened at the end of one of the um, presentations, and it was all about how EMS are overworked and underpaid um, and looking at what can we do, what's happening out in the community, um, you know, in different agencies all over the U.S. So it's, um, it's you know, very near and dear to my heart in terms of taking care of our EMS professionals and making sure, um, you know, financial health is one aspect of that. So um, I certainly am you know, enthused that there are other people out there who are um, talking about doing this research and making uh, interventions as well, hopefully to uh, to improve kind of the state of it. Right, I think this is an absolutely important conversation and it's nice that this study did a good job at putting some numbers behind things that, you know, anecdotally we've always kind of known, but this study really quantifies that. Exactly. And so I think it makes sense for us to spend just a few minutes on the nerdy part of this. I know Tony has some questions and things that he wants to talk about in the methods. So Tony, would you like to kick us off and talk a little bit about study design and we'll get Madison in on, you know, the source of the data. He must be on mute. <laughs> I, believe, I believe he's muted. <laughs> Yeah, I was a new microphone. It's a beautiful new microphone, but if it's on mute, we can't hear you. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, I was trying not to uh, sneeze and cough uh, when everyone else was speaking. But um, yes, I was on mute. I, I just wanted to uh, say welcome again to Madison. and Thank you uh, for letting us discuss your great study today. Um, so this was a, a cross-sectional analysis, and we, we hear about cross-sectional analyses uh, uh, quite often uh, in EMS research. And uh, so first let's talk about what a cross-sectional analysis actually is. So when you're talking about a cross-sectional analysis, you can think of a snapshot or a picture at, at a moment in time. In a cross-sectional analysis, we're not following patients um, going forward. This is, that, that would be a longitudinal analysis. Uh, we are not um, we're not looking at any any historical records or make or or following people multiple years in the past. Um, this is a, a a survey essentially that's sent out at a moment in time, and the results from that survey represent just that moment in time. Um, so I'd like to uh, at this point, can we, Ma Madison? Can you tell us a little bit about how you? Um, one came up with your your objective uh, and a little bit more about why you decided to use a cross-sectional survey uh, to elicit these results. Sure, um, so great, dis uh, great description of a cross-sectional evaluation. Um, what we were able to do was look, um, using the National EMS Certification Database, we were able to look at a national level for that snapshot. Um, so we were able to kind of utilize um, an ongoing system. So um, the 2017 and 2000 to 2018 recertification cycle with the National EMS database is what we used. Um, so this is housed and organized by the National Registry of EMTs. And so all nationally certified EMS professionals every two years um, are uh, responsible to recertify. Um, so this requires putting in an application in order to maintain their credentials to keep working as an EMS professional. And so, um, so EMTs, AEMTs, and paramedics um, every, every two years um, or every year at, at a different cycle um, are responsible for filling in this application. We found um, at the National Registry, we found that this would be a great opportunity to take um, kind of that snapshot or use um, the data from this to analyze it um, for cross-sectional evaluation and say, you know, every time, um, so every time going forward that people are recertifying, um, taking a look at different questions for the workforce. So, um, so this was the very first opportunity we had to kind of look at some of these workforce questions um, in addition to the questions that are asked about what kind of agency you, um, you work for, um, uh, you know, how many organizations you work for in general. Um, so the reason we, we went forward with this was it was a great way to kind of get um, a snapshot of the workforce and some of these questions about workforce wellness. Um, so it was a great opportunity to um, kind of get a look at prevalence of different issues or different um, 
topics and outcomes that you know we're concerned about or curious about in EMS. Um, so, and so this was the first the, uh, the first opportunity we took for um, using the recertification cycle as a, a method of um, surveying our our EMS prof professionals at a national level. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, yeah. Really good. And you have um, you were able to do all, all levels uh, from EMT to paramedic. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, um, EMRs um, they also go through a recertification cycle, um, but they were on a different timeline. So we were able to survey EMTs, AEMTs, and paramedics. Right. So the way this worked, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you had uh, you attached a survey to their re-registration paperwork. The re-registration paperwork was uh, mandatory to keep their certification, but the the survey was actually an optional survey that they filled out at the end of their their recertification paperwork. That's correct. Um, we worked with our IT team to make it as seamless as possible. Um, so it was kind of tacked on to their application. So as soon as they submitted that, um, then they were provided with this um, very fairly brief survey. Um, and it was optional, but we also wanted to try to get as many people as possible um, on board with it. Um, response rates are always something we're concerned about. Um, so in order to uh, to make it um, as seamless and you know it kind of included in the application so it was optional but we provided it um, immediately at the end and kind of streamlined so it, it looked very similar to the, the application um, in order to try to, to try to get as many people um, to answer it as possible yeah i think that's a good idea and um, one of the and maybe you can speak to this benefit uh, with surveys and especially you just spoke about kind of having to uh, maximize your response rates because it's really tough with surveys particularly online surveys um, attaching it to the re registration you you were likely able to pull some things off their re registration paperwork and kind of reduce your the total number of survey items is that right I, I'd imagine that certification level and maybe some um, some demographics you may not have had to ask in your survey because you had it in their reread work. Is that correct? Exactly. That's uh, that's correct. So we were able to um, look at the certification level that people were um, already working at. We had their age, um, their sex, and their race. So in terms of um, you know survey burden is always a concern. Uh, having to ask someone. Um, a whole bunch of different questions, redu you know, might be an annoyance for them, but it also reduces the likelihood that they will complete the survey. Um, so tying it with the National EMS Certification Database and the application that they were filling out already, um, we were able to, to pull the data from there and then therefore, just like you said, reduce the amount that um, we were asking people to, to supply us in addition, um, which, you know, also a kind of streamlined process in terms of the respondent as well as um, the data that we were collecting. I think that's so critical. It's really interesting to me how how much we uh, you know hate surveys for paramedics and EMTs that are recertifying. You know, we just want to get our research stuff in, and we don't we ignore any extra questions that don't really need to be there. And 22% uh, return rate on a survey is is uh you know i think pitiful for ems we need to uh think about when when we're given the opportunity to have a voice and and respond to some of those uh research questions that that are posed to us that it, it really matters later on and I, i'm really happy to see the numbers because you know there's there's 18,000 some people that, that you were able to survey so there's definitely a lot of people that are working overtime and and um, uh, and and helping shape the future of our of our profession, and took the time to actually reply to this. But for for we have entire paramedic classes that join us on this on this podcast, and I want to make sure that everybody is tuned into you know the future's in our hands. It's not a matter of you know some uh, outside folks trying to paint a picture, uh, it's, it's critical that when, when our own national certification system is asking us a, on, a, on a recertification moment, please uh, you know, reply to this, it, it's, it's critical. I also think it, this is the way we, that the practice analysis was done, and I think Tony and Rimley could, could uh, echo the importance of that uh, practice analysis. 
uh, and the the importance of answering those questions when given the opportunity, right? Absolutely, and I think there's so much survey development that tends to be either unappreciated or just unknown. You know, we think that making a survey is really easy. You just go on to SurveyMonkey and ask a question, right? And then everybody answers it and interprets it exactly the way that you thought of the question. <laughs> that tends yeah. to not be the case. And I, you know, both Tony and I were fellows at the National Registry where you really do get a solid training in survey development. And perhaps Madison can speak a little bit to, you know, how do you go about developing new survey when you know there just isn't a question out there that has been validated yet that's a great question um, that's something we're, we're very mindful of um, you know survey research is kind of its its own little niche um, so we we want to make sure it's as you know methods heavy as other research is um, so often what we do especially um, within the, the fellowship who I've been I've been fortunate enough to follow in Remley and Tony's footsteps um, so what we do is we, any question that we can use from previously validated surveys, such as leads, and we often use those while we're, if we have a new question on, you know, a topic such as overtime or if someone's working multiple jobs, um, in order to just make sure that we're uh, able to get the information that we want, um, we often do some cognitive testing. So that always, um, always involves going into the community and asking EMS providers, uh, often from various backgrounds, um, locations, kind of getting a broad um, or a, a diverse look at the perspective that someone might have. So looking at um, providing them with the question and then their impression of what the question means. Um, so this, this kind of cognitive testing um, uh, uh, process is often what we do in order to make sure that um, the questions we're asking pr will hopefully provide us with the answers and kind of making sure it's as um, understandable as standardized as possible because um, I think in EMS we know you know you've seen one EMS system you've seen one EMS system so uh, the language we use you know it changes agency to agency state to state um, especially when we're doing, you know, research on a national population of EMS professionals, we want to make sure that um, it will be interpreted, you know, by as many people as possible um, to kind of mean the same thing. So uh, making sure that, you know, the surveys we're using are validated and tested in um, as many ways as possible is, is certainly very important to us. I, I know Bill wants to say a couple of words, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, just sneak in here that you, you, um, you, you just kind of alluded to something pretty critical in our profession that maybe listeners have never heard of. So what do you mean by leads? What's That's a great question. Um, so what, so Tony actually mentioned, so um, this study was a cross-sectional study, uh, a longitudinal study is another method of research. Um, so lead stands for the longitudinal assessment of EMS attributes. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, might, might have missed a letter in the that acronym there. Um, so there have been two rounds of this LEAD study. So it's a, a longitudinal look, meaning following up with EMS professionals over a period of time. Um, so the first, the first round of LEADs happened um, several years ago. The more recent one was a, a five-year process. Um, and so this was meant to be kind of a research study that over time looked at the progression and the different um, demographics and attributes of EMS professionals. Um, and so uh, looking at those over, you know, using a longitudinal method over time also allowed for, um, to kind of capture some of the fluctuations, um, various measures such as, you know, the um, different EMS agencies, um, different, also different outcomes such as um, health, outcomes or health measures, um, violence or um, uh, the, you know, different exposures that EMS providers um, were, were exposed to was another measure. So um, in, in research, we refer to leads quite frequently, but that's a, a very good question. Um, so it's a, a very, um, very general look at the, the EMS workforce um, on, a, on a longitudinal level. Cool. cool. Thank you. I was actually surprised that we haven't done anything around this before. Uh, so it seems like one of those, duh, uh, it seems like we're all working overtime. 
and then we maybe something was done before but when i looked at the at the paper i was trying to find references to, to previous studies and did a quick search on any paper i had ever looked at and um and the word overtime came up for nurses it came up for other health professions but not for ems so um cool that you you just focused in on that okay all right i think i've interrupted uh uh bill a bit so uh, any comments bill yeah i just uh, wanted to go back talk a little nerdy for, for a moment here because we were talking about response rates and stuff and this uh, happens to be an area of uh, expertise for my uh, spouse who does this for um, a very large matter of fact the number one retailer in the world so that's her area of one of her area of expertise and i asked her on her experience uh, with response rate, she says it varies depending upon if there is an incentive or not for the um, for the survey, and then how well you know the respondents in the survey. So if you have an incentive plus an engaged audience, you may get you may and they know who the sender is, who it's coming from. They may get a response rate greater than forty percent. But if there's no incentive, it's email, and they don't even know who the sender is. It's not surprised to have less than a one percent return rate. And that's in her area. And so the, the key thing that I thought that people talked about is you just cannot take Survey Monkey and ask a question and put a lot of weight into necessarily what comes back from that. Yeah, great points. Great points. Incentive makes a big difference. And that's something that you yeah. don't see in a lot of well, for, EMS. For incentive, you, need, you need funding. And for funding, like uh, we need to find people who are willing to fund EMS research, and that is tough. That is tough. It's, it is very tough because it's not- Particularly for surveys. Well, it's not just surveys. I mean, it, it, all of medicine cha is challenged by the issue related to funding. It's not unique just to EMS, but we're certainly low in the totem pole. Sure, sure, sure. And 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 for listeners who want to do research, that also brings up the, uh, you know, the consequences of incentivizing a, a a project into the institutional review board or, or ethics review boards that maybe will say well um, how are you incentivizing this frankly there is already kind of a built-in incentive if you're recertifying um you know maybe you're you're thinking boy i better answer this or else i'm not going to get recertified and so i'm sure uh your your team madison said uh, there is no consequence if you don't reply to these questions that will not affect your recertification, but please help us out if you can kind of story. Uh, yep, that's that's correct. So incentive is, uh, incentives are um, always, you know, I think there are there are data out there actually that show, you know, the likelihood of um, increased response rates with incentives um, and various other me measures as well. So uh, following up, you know, one or two weeks after you've sent out the original message um, and several other different components. Um, but I think one of the big considerations we have is, you know, how can we increase people's response rates? So um, the funding for incentives is, um, is much needed in general, you know, general research um, as well as survey research. Um, so we, we were trying to do a workaround essentially by including this in the recertification application um, to you know, reduce the need for additional funding and incentives. Um, however, in other surveys we've done, when it's um, a smaller, um, a smaller sample, um, we have been able to acquire some funding, um, which you know, being able to to give back to our respondents is always ideal. Um, so, kind of using the different methods um, dependent on funding um, is is certainly pretty um, pretty ideal. And as as you know, like you mentioned. Um, the, the IRB or the need for a, a review board as well, um, that factors in uh, as well. And do you think that this kind of skewed the results a little bit? Because nationally certified providers are already people who, if they're recertifying, have kind of a, a, an interest in EMS more than just the average provider who might say, uh, might have gotten nationally registered, but then dropped it because it had no consequence to their job and they didn't really need to recertify. So, so there's probably already a, a bias in that these are, these are people who kind of are the, the 
uh, upper crust, if you will, the people who, who want to continue to voluntarily re-register, that might might have skewed your, your data in favor of people who, who might be more conscientious and, and dedicated and perhaps, you know, more of them work overtime, do you think, or, or the opposite? Wait, I'm gonna, I want to just jump in there just for a second. I don't think there is a dramatic difference between a nationally registered and a non-nationally registered. And one of the early leads uh, snapshots, uh, one of the work they did, because I was involved in leads one, and uh, we looked at that and we found that there is there wasn't a great disparity between people who were nationally registered and state only. And so I'm not sure we can make necessarily that jump. I don't disagree with your thought process there. there. But national but registry has dramatically changed now versus when even Leeds 1 came out. There are far less states that are non-registry than at the time that was done. But there was no difference seen between that group. And there is a paper out there that, that discusses this uh, this process. I'd like to comment on two points there as well with this particular population. So now I believe, and Madison can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, recertification through national registry is required by about nine states to continue to practice. So you know that's one group of people. And then Tony and I, as we were preparing this for this article discussion, you know, we discussed that well, the fact that they're doing their recertification application means that they haven't left the study yet or haven't left the field yet. So if anything, this suggests that this study is going to be an underestimate of the effect, and we have not got to the results yet. Spoiler alert, we did see an effect of this working additional hours on the likelihood of leaving the profession. So I think that's something important just to keep in mind. This study is probably conservative. Absolutely. So let's, um, we got a lot of talk about the results. Um, so before we get there, let's just plow through some important things um, in, the, in the methods, and then we'll get to the exciting stuff. Um, so I think, Madison, you made some really wise decisions with your exclusion criteria. Um, you removed provi providers who were not uh, involved in patient care. Um, you removed providers who were not working for an EMS organization, as well as any folks in the military and those who were younger than 18 or older than 85. Um, I think that, uh, I think for your question, your research question, I think that the exclusion criteria is appropriate. Um, do you have anything, uh, any, any insights on, on how you chose those? Um, so we definitely put a lot of uh, intention behind our inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, especially when we're looking at people who, you know, the dependence on overtime or multiple jobs. We wanted to make sure that the population we were looking at um, was, you know, the, the primary working population. Um, so I think we we chose the 18 to 85 range, um, just sort of at that national level for the um, likely you know working workforce. Um, but we also wanted to make sure it was people who are currently currently working in the EMS uh, patient care setting. Um, so I think David, what you mentioned, uh, there are people who um, do recertify and you know maintain their um, national certification. Um, while not actually working, you know, on the ambulance or practicing patient care. So we wanted to make sure that we were looking at people who are specifically, you know, currently working, um, you know, on the ambulance in the field in order to be um, able to measure that, you know, dependence on overtimes and multiple jobs. Um, so that was that was certainly something we specifically wanted to look at. Um, and those were questions that we asked them in the beginning in order to then um, you know, tailor our, our sample population to do the analysis on people um, who are, you know, active and working in EMS currently. I think that was really smart. And because we're talking about overtime and multiple jobs and the like, um, you use the term to make ends meet. Um, and I think that it's important yeah, for that. to have a, a, a working definition of how that was utilized in the survey. So can you can you talk about um, the term make ends meet and how and what that means in, in, in terms of your results? Sure. Um, so we use the term make ends meet. Um, it has been that term actually has been used in previous um, previous studies on um, different public health uh, measures. So in terms of work being a social determinant um, and various other economics papers as well. Um, so we use the term make ends meet, which we recognize as a subjective measure. Um, so it, it isn't a measure on, or it, it is an, ob an objective measure um, about, you know, how much 
someone makes, you know, their income specifically, um, or how much at the end of the day they take away. Um, but we found that the use of the term make ends meet, um, we actually preferred it as a subjective measure. So if someone, you know, is stressed out and doesn't feel like they can make a living or, you know, make ends meet, they're having trouble paying their bills um, because they are, you know, they're not able to make enough money to you know, make ends meet um, with a typical 40 hour work week and that forces them to then work overtime or pick up another you know a second job or work part time on the side in addition to their their main job um, we found that we wanted we wanted to capture that and say um, especially with there's so many factors that um, go into you know just taking an objective measure of someone's income with our national population there's fluctuations in the quality or um, the cost of living um, you know people have different different levels of you know that um, the spending that they might have on a day-to-day -day basis or monthly so we wanted to capture how people felt about working at EMS and if they could make ends meet pay, you know that it is kind of an individual measure but we wanted that subjective look to say you know how do people feel that they are able to make a living in EMS um, and so we found that uh, this term you know having been used before we found was a good a good measure for that outcome. No, I think that was great. We'll talk about um, just really briefly on uh, your statistical analysis. So you calculate descriptive statistics for demographics and work-related characteristics. That's important for, for most studies. And you did some uh, separate multivariable logistic regression models. Um, can, you, can you give us a brief summary of, of your models and, and how those were built? Sure. Uh, so we did three separate models. Um, we adjusted them for the various characteristics um, in order to kind of control for those which are quite common in logistic regression. So we adjusted um, each model for potential confounders. That was sex, age, minority status, certification level, which we looked at um, kind of ALS versus BLS. So EMTs compared to AEMTs and paramedics together. Um, the type of agency they were working for, whether they were full-time or part-time, as well as their urbanicity or wh where they were living. Um, so the three different models that we looked at, um, the outcome was, um, or the exposure was the dependence on additional work, whether that be overtime or multiple jobs. And then the three different outcomes that we used for those three separate models um, was first job satisfaction, and then intention to leave EMS either within one year or within five years. Um, so we conducted the logistic regressions on um, all three of those models to look at that association. Great work. All right, all right. I think we're ready to move into the results. Well, we do have one question from the audience on the method still, so I think I'll, I'll go ahead and bring that one in. Um, Bill Lidio wanted to talk about how incentives come to play in national surveys, particularly when we have an IRB. And so I think that is something worth talking about. we should discuss that the incentives have to be something that makes people want to participate in, but is it something that they can't afford to turn down? So it can't be seen as coercion. So often some of the incentives I've seen used in the past have been things like chance to win X, Y, or Z, something of small value or um, sometimes education credit if there's some education associated with taking the survey or reading something after the survey in a short quiz. I don't know, Tony, are you familiar with some other incentives that have been used on a national scale for these kinds of things? So there's a lot of research that suggests that incentives can be pretty um, uh, minimal uh, and, and folks will have some uh, desire to participate. So. For instance, uh, this is not an EMS survey, but I know that Gallup will send you out a nice crisp new dollar bill um, if you're going to fill out a Gallup poll. And they found that that has uh, dramatically increased their response rates because people feel a sense of obligation, even though it's just a dollar. Um, there's been some research on um, stickers and, and things like that um, that have worked. So I, I think that the the incentives it, it really is and I, I think the bill talked about this earlier it, it's based on the population and you really need to know who you're surveying and and how motivated they are to fill out the survey i i can tell you on leads one with the, the initial one i can't remember you know because i just looked back and saw that it was 1999 
or earlier that we started on the leads project but i know when we sent out the first core survey the incentive was if you completed the survey your name was put into a basket to win two airline tickets for x amount of money and that was a, a to try to incentivize people to complete it because the original the the core survey is very lengthy uh, and committed a lot of time to do it Actually, I, I, I love Greg Fries's comment uh, here about um, incentive, suggesting an uh, incentive, incentivizing this by a discount on your registry renewal fee. That might be nice, a nice way to, uh, you know, not only just, you know, draw a lot, but, but also do that. Good. Uh, absolutely. That's, uh, that's something we've talked about um, internally at the registry, especially with, you know, the population we're, we're working with and, you know, in order to show appreciation for those who are um, providing us with research to then be able to give back and help the community. Um, so we always thank them for, you know, this, this research truly is being turned around and helps um, used to help the community. Um, but uh, certainly that's, that's been a, a topic of discussion in the, in the registry. Um, to be able to discount or provide them with uh, the recertification fees um, as an incentive. Um, so everyone will have to uh, to stay tuned. It's quite possible that's in the works. Love it, love it, love it. Well, this and been... right, sorry, yeah. right before we go to results, I do think it's, it's uh, worthy as we talk about sort of the findings of the paper now. Um, it, in the, it was actually in the intro section, but um, uh, critical that we point out paramedics uh, and EMTs are earning the on average $20 an hour for paramedics or 21 and $14 an hour for EMTs whereas firefighters get paid 25 uh, to $26 an hour on average and police officers 31 to $32 an hour so um, uh, in the context of making ends meet and just the fact that we're "Quote unquote underpaid." I thought that comparison in the introduction was a, a very useful thing to have in print in the scientific literature, and uh, and so I applaud you for for putting that into context, right? Because we can make more by working at McDonald's, uh, and people can you know get second jobs doing all sorts of things, but um, as we will dive into here, what happens to our you know. Uh, sleep deprivation and and uh home and and health uh just physical health around you know working multiple jobs so yeah yeah i think um the reason we included that first and foremost was you know putting a number to it and being able to provide in a, you know some context and i think one of the biggest things is people outside of ems actually don't don't understand or don't realize that ems um, doesn't make the same as police officers or as firefighters. Um, often EMS is kind of lumped in together. You know, they're all first responding agencies, um, helping the public, you know, help, helping public safety um, and within healthcare. But I, I found it was very important to actually give a number. So using that um, the statistic from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, just to be able to provide some context for those who might not be familiar that um, there is a pretty big wage disparity happening um, within the industry. So I think we wanted to make sure people were, were well aware that on a national level, those numbers were pretty staggering. Absolutely. Yes. So with right. that, um, yeah, let's, let's move into the punchline. What's that? Let's go to the punchline. Yeah. yeah All right, let's, let's do this. So we are, for those of you who can't see the screen, we're looking at table one, and there were over 18,000 EMS professionals included in this study. I'll hit a couple of the highlights on demographics, but won't belabor them too much. So 74% were male. The median age was 38. The majority were white, non-Hispanic, so it's 89%. As far as urbanicity, 61% were in urban environments. And then we have a split on certification levels, so 41% EMT, about 5% AEMT, and 53% paramedic. Um, the most common agency type was fire-based, and typically folks were working in 12-hour or 24-hour um, shifts. So Madison, how did these results compare overall to the nationally certified population? Were there any surprises or anything that we should keep in mind as we go into the other results of this study? 
Uh, so that's a great point. Um, we always want to make sure in our sample population, it, uh, we need to keep in mind the general population in terms of kind of that generalizability and representation um, that we have in our in our study. So um, typically, in terms of the um, the sex. Uh, breakdown, um, EMS is typically very male dominated. Um, the median age that we found was fairly similar, sort of the mid to late 30s in terms of um, the, the age of people working in EMS. Um, and the urbanicity breakdown as well was fairly similar. Um, in terms of the minority status, um, we categorized as minority and white non-Hispanic. Um, typically, we do see more um, white non-Hispanic members it, working in EMS. Um, and so this was was a little bit skewed with um, less representation from minority respondents. Um, so in terms of uh, the results, we do need to make sure that um, uh, just keeping in mind. So our population was um, uh, who responded was um, typically more white than the general population of EMS professionals. Um, also more urban are uh, living in urban settings um, as well as more paramedics responded. Um, so we just, in terms of kind of what this means, we looked at um, these, the, the difference in the general population, we, we thought that um, it was likely that uh, the motivation for people to respond could have been different, um, as well as people for some of those associations. Um, so people who are paramedics, it's possible that, um, or I, I might be skipping ahead in terms of the results, um, but we, we certainly need to keep those in mind. Um, so that's a great point, Remley, that um, differences between our sample population and the national population. I'm going to defend you a little bit. I, I, Madison, I, I don't, I think that you barely had uh, more paramedics, 53% versus the 40 to roughly percent and five percent of EMTs and and five percent of AEMTs, I I actually expected to see a massive amount of paramedics versus EMTs, and this is split. Uh, you know, fifty three percent is just not uh, a slight majority, but not too bad actually. And I also thought it was really interesting. We had you know nearly thirty nine percent rural participation, and that to me is also really a strong indicator. I think I, I'm, I, I don't think you should beat yourself up there um, just in terms of you know participation from ranks that uh, we, we wanted to hear from, especially because we have a lot of volunteer EMTs that are not, not uh, compensated in, in the rural settings. So um, already the, the, uh, you know, the, the results, you know you can anticipate going, wow, this is, this is profound. So good job. Hi. Something else I want to highlight here is that, you know, in this study, the authors took the time to actually compare the respondent population to the overall population of those who are recertifying. And I think that is critically important as we want to interpret the results of any study. We need to first, you know, always take a good look at table one and say, you know, does this pass gut check for internal validity before we move on to worrying about external validity? And I think these authors have been about that. Yeah, and, and there's findings here that are, I think, important to kind of, maybe people already know this, but I was struck by 40% of, of EMS workers are working 24-hour shifts, at least the, the, the people who responded to this survey said so, and right below it, 28% were working 12-hour shifts. So we're still very much in the work the long, the long shift, work fewer days a week, and I know, you know, and uh, where I work, if if we were to propose going to eight-hour shifts, like a, a local ambulance service did do, uh, the union and the and the providers go crazy because they like those, you know, three-day work weeks, and uh, and and we have to ask ourselves what what is that really doing to our bodies? I, I know there have been studies on firefighters about uh, the, the, the duration of shifts, which is not the focus of this paper, but I'm glad you, you actually um, uh, documented that because it's, it's yet another indica indicator of you know, long hours, underpaid, and, uh, and overworked kind of story. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point. Um, so it, it was it was interesting to see, you know, definitely the 12 hour and the 24 hour shifts was the majority of respondents. 
Um, and I think that it's interesting, just what you said. So a lot of people see it as a great opportunity for you know someone to work two 24 hour shifts. That means they've got a 48 hour work week in two days. Um, so that's, that's fairly typical in EMS. Um, and especially with EMS agencies that are tied with a fire agency. Um, so that's fairly common, but unfortunately, while some people see that as a, a benefit or, you know, it could be why someone gets into EMS or why they stick with it, um, there's a lot of benefit to having a short, a shortened, you know, full work week. Um, we also see that there's been a lot of research illustrating the negative consequences that can happen from, from those longer shift durations. So I think it's very interesting because on the individual level, um, potentially on an agency level too, this can be a great opportunity for someone. However, we're seeing in previous studies as well as this one, um, that there, there actually might be more, more harm than good that can happen. Um, and so there's a lot of factors, but I think that's a very important consideration in terms of the, the wellness of the workforce. Right, Madison, I think you bring up a great point that is going to help us explain what I think we can look at next, which is figure one. And so shift work probably has a large impact on what we're seeing for figure one. So I'll describe that. We're seeing that 4.5% of those included in the analysis worked 41 or more hours. And as Madison did a really great job at explaining, that is probably due to if you just work your 224 shifts, that gets you there. And so I think that's an important point. Yeah, Certainly. it's just built into your work week that you're going to be working overtime. Uh, and I'm curious if you split that down into, you know, past 48 hours so that we could account for the, uh, in fact, you know, in some cases, 24 uh, hour rotations get you to 56 hours some weeks, and then, you know, a lot fewer, if any, the next weeks. So um, I don't know if you did a, a secondary analysis of that. So the reason we actually, um, that's a great question. The reason we looked at the past four, 14 days, so in kind of a two week span, we wanted to get an average or kind of the general, um, the general amount of hours worked. Um, so we, we could have uh, surveyed respondents about the past 48 hours, but we also wanted to take a look at, you know, the past 48 hours, someone easily could have worked 56 hours. Um, or you know a, a 56 hour work week within the past um, within the past week. Um, but then we wanted to just make sure we were getting a, a good look at on average, you know within a two week span, how often were people working? Um, and as Remley stated, so we're seeing um, about 75 percent of them are working over 41 hours, um, which I think is a very, very significant finding that we need to um, we certainly need to to talk about more in EMS. Um, and then we wanted to kind of, you know, further in our research, we then wanted to look at, um, you know, was this, uh, what was the reason for this? You know, was it, um, was it needed or did they have the dependence on this, um, which, you know, goes into, goes into the reason behind this study. Right. And if we go ahead and take a look at table two, we can see some of the results of this. So looking at just the first line of table two, depending on overtime to make ends meet. 57% of respondents said yes to that. And then another 56% of those who answered depended on more than one job to make ends meet. And then we go to the either or statement because obviously there could be overlap between those two things. That's 71%. These results to me are a little bit higher than I would have expected, but probably fit in with some of the other literature out there. What are your thoughts on that? I think, yeah, the, um, the statistics so separately, um, working on or depending on overtime, um, over half of respondents said that they depend on this additional work to make ends meet. And then uh, separately from that, over half of our respondents said that they depend on more than one job um, to make ends meet. So looking at, um, you know, we, we group these together saying, you know, additional work, um, but looking at the statistics of it. So in EMS, 71% of people um, are relying on working multiple jobs, working overtime, um, are you know working extra in order to make ends meet. Um, and in terms of kind of the EMS fitting within, you know, it's a healthcare profession. 
Um, it's it's a very, very tough job. It's also providing, you know, life-saving interventions. Um, it's pretty shocking to see that, you know, the, overall the very high majority of our respondents say they're depend depending on additional work in order to make a living. In terms of, you know, supporting um, our workforce and people being able to make a living in EMS, um, I think that statistic is is fairly uh, fairly shocking and saying that, you know, most people have to work over 40, you know, the typical work week just to, to make ends meet. Right. And I think another thing in this table is that 6% are planning to leave EMS within a year and then about a quarter, 26% are planning to leave EMS within five years. I was really struck by that, that statistic because Remley, you did some work uh, in, in your research and, and by the way, congratulations on winning best research at NMSP. Uh, so for listeners who don't know that, Remley just cleaned up uh, with, her, with her latest uh, project. But, um, but you did some work on you know, likelihood to leave the profession and stress and burnout. And so does this kind of jive with that? Is this out of proportion with that? No, this absolutely jives with that. So one of the things I looked at specifically was job demands and resources on burnout. And one of those job demands has to do with, you know, not making enough pay to make ends meet. So that's another thing I really like about this study is it uses the exact same wording as another survey that's out there. This was among South Carolina EMS professionals, so not a nationally certified population. And what I found was 65% of people said they depended on overtime to make ends meet. And then that was associated with almost a threefold increase in odds of burnout. And we know that burnout is also associated with about a threefold increase in odds of leaving the profession. So all of this is really a complex web that there's not likely to be a silver bullet for. But we're starting to put some numbers and some research behind each component of this, which I think is really important. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so underpaid, overworked, uh, to, you know, long hours, night shifts, and uh, and and now this is gearing up to say uh, why aren't you know it, it's the uh, Bill Leg you made a comment in our in our um, uh, questions it's the elephant in the room right why aren't we paying providers what they're worth or at least enough to make ends meet without having to work second and third jobs it certainly isn't that they you know somehow want to subscribe to more. Uh, you know, I don't know, direct TV and get uh, uh, get, get better, uh, 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 I don't know, the latest and greatest non-essential information. This is about making ends meet, putting food on the table with their families. Um, I know in many states, our providers can't even afford a, a mortgage. They're not going to ever own their own home because it's just not possible on salaries they have. And then we wonder why there's a shortage in the country of providers. It's a, it's a, a workforce uh, issue. Right, it's all related. And if we want to move to table three, because I know we're coming up on eight minutes left, I do want to look at the magnitude of the effect that we're seeing. So these things do have an impact. We're seeing that the odds of being dissatisfied with an EMS job are over twofold higher for those who are depending on that additional income to make ends meet. And then that intention to leave EMS within one year also had a significant relationship. That odds ratio is about 1.5. And it also demonstrated a significant relationship with intending to leave 0.3 there. So, that's after controlling for some of these other variables that are really important things like the age of the provider. So we could say, oh, well, maybe it has to do with retirement. That's not what these data are showing. I think that's worth pointing out. Exactly, yeah. So I think some of those, those factors we controlled for are very telling. So whether someone's working at a private, a private agency or someone's full-time or part-time even, depending on uh, urbanicity, so where they're living, which, you know, can kind of be a proxy potentially for um, the cost of living, um, we still saw significant uh, significant associations bef between um, dissatisfaction being the highest odds. Um, if someone's depending on the additional work, they're more likely to be dissatisfied, um, as well as certainly the intentions of leaving, um, both within one year, um, had an increased odds of intending to leave. Um, and again, for those who were depending on 
this additional income in order to make ends meet, uh, within five years, they had a higher odds of um, intending to leave. So I think that's in terms of, you know, we talk about turnover and retention. Um, for EMS, it's it's often an issue or a topic of discussion, um, but we're seeing, you know, this these data show us that um, these people are, unfortunately, they're dissatisfied with the job and they are um, have high intentions of, of leaving, um, which is associated with um, their dependence on additional work. Absolutely. So it may be actually cheaper to pay people a little bit better and to retain them uh, not burn them out than to actually be in this constant need to find more, train them more, uh, and and obviously there's a there's not just an opportunity cost but a real dollars cost to all of that process by which uh, you onboard a new employee. It, it's um, I think people need to pay attention to the study. I I wanted to tweet this off of the tallest roof, rooftops and see if if perhaps the media can get a hold of this to to again. Uh, put this in context for the wider audience and the public uh, and say, you know, this is, this is hard science around we don't get paid well and we're, we're, we're going to leave. You're spot on, Dave, and there has been some research on that cost of turnover. So Dr. Daniel Patterson out of Pittsburgh did a study about the actual median cost of turnover per person. It was something like $10,000 per person and the, average, or the median agency was spending over 60000 on you know turnover and those numbers don't quote me but there is some research out there that says this this turnover and this constant switching of agencies is actually far more costly absolutely um, thankfully we do have we do have a lot of research out there um, and actually so in terms of the media that you were mentioning Dave so a recent article actually came out with NBC News um, and it's called so medical first responders say they're underpaid and overworked will anything change this actually came out uh, very recently in December, um, and it's it's great because the you know in EMS we know that this is a problem. I think our community is talking about this, but obviously in order to make um, change, we do need to go beyond. Um, and you know there are policy implications. So um, this the article actually talks about um, EMS professionals in New York who say that um, they are certainly not paid the same uh, despite working in similar environments of police officers and firefighters um, and so they're actually, they actually pursuing um, pursuing uh, a legal action on this just because of the huge wage disparity that is occurring um, so I think that the research and media can go hand in hand to kind of talk more about this, especially when we have the, you know, the, the data to back it up. I think that's so critical. And, you know, part of the discussion back in the 80s and 90s when, uh, when some of these systems went from being health and hospital to, to uh, fire third service, really, not actually uh, part of the fire suppression side of life. There's a there's a lot of talk uh, in, in the public about how these jobs were not as dangerous. And so I think now we have some studies that say, you know what, EMTs and paramedics are risking their lives, perhaps even losing their lives or, or being injured at an equal or greater rate than our, our, our brethren in other professions. But, um, you know, I like Greg Fries's comment too from EMS1, the, e the EMS trends report, which uses a convenience sample, has also found similar troubling responses about plans to leave the profession. So, um, you know, I think with multiple sources now, I think it's, uh, we're able to at least bring more attention to this. In, in Melbourne, Australia, Ambulance Victoria paramedics started spray painting their ambulances with, we're underpaid, you know, we can get more better jobs at McDonald's, um, et cetera. <clears throat> and, and to be honest, when I saw it, I thought, how, how disgusting this is. This is, um, you know, using your ambulance as a billboard for your for your own salary seemed, you know, ethically compromising. But it became an election issue, and the politicians picked up on it, and it seemed to me like an extreme measure to bring the public and, and make them aware. But it, uh, it worked because the, the, the uh, elected politician had run on a platform that said, we need to make sure we have, you know, our paramedics are paid and they're now earning 100K a year, um, uh, you know, even uh, starting in some cases. So there, there was a, a definite uh, you know, magnifying glass brought to the issue. 
and it uh, it is an election year in the United States. So should we start spray painting ambulances? Spray painting? Oh, silence. No one wanted to touch that one. And that no, I, I think we're out of time. No, just kidding. <laughs> We do have to, I know we have to wrap up. So I just want to say, I'm just going to start my wrap up right now. I want to thank the author for taking the time to come on here, but also to take the time to produce the paper and publish it. I do think it's an important one. It will be nice to even see, you know, replication and continued research in this area because we need hard facts to convince uh, the politicians and other people that the change needs to happen. Paramedics, EMTs or EMS workers in general need to make a true living wage that makes them equitable to their counterparts that do fire suppression and law enforcement. And it should not be a job that you have to work until you're 65 and you can take your social security retirement. You need to be able to have a job that allows you to truly retire with, again, equity that is often seen within fire suppression as well as within law enforcement. But again, I want to thank you guys all for the time. I think this is a a really worthy discussion. And uh, the, lo the last thing I'd say is, is it's hard to get these people to think about doing more education when we can't take care of their fundamental needs. I agree. Thank you for that comment, Bill. And I want to thank the audience for all of their participation. There's a ton of chatting going on behind the scenes, and I know that we weren't able to get to all of these questions, but I do hope that we can keep this discussion going on social media. So continue to tweet and Facebook this article, discussing it, and draw some attention to it. Also, this will hopefully further some additional research as Bill put need replication of the study and further digging into the reasons of, you know, are we seeing this in other professions? Is this really unique to EMS? I know was one of the comments and I think we definitely need some more data on that. So again, I really wanna thank you, Madison, for taking the time to share your work here with us. And we look forward to talking to you more in the future. Absolutely, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. And with that, I'm going to wrap us up. So please remember to join us for the Education Research Podcast later this month on Friday, January 24th at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central. And we will be back here with our clinical podcast on the second Monday of the month, which will be February 10th. Thank you all for listening and look forward to being here with you next time.